We're in my studio at home in South East London. One day I opened my email inbox and there's like 10 emails from a very disparate bunch of people saying, you've got to go to eBay now and buy this. And what it was was Kraftwerk's original vocoder, which was being sold on eBay. And it was the one that was used on Autobahn. I thought, well, this is the equivalent to, for a guitarist of getting Jimi Hendrix guitar that was used on Purple Haze or something, you know. I first got a synthesizer in 1977 and I bought a second hand Korg 700S from Macari's music shop in Charing Cross Road. The thing that pissed me off about punk was that you had to learn three chords to, to be in a punk band. If you had a synthesizer, you had to do is press one key with a finger, you know. I don't need a TV screen. I just stick the aerial into my skin. Advances in technology in the late 70s heralded the invention of the affordable synth, costing no more than an electric guitar. Daniel Miller used his to form The Normal, an experimental act that supported punk groups. Miller drew on the work of English author J.G. Ballard, whose crash was another futuristic vision of Britain. Warm leatherette. Warm leatherette. I'd just broken up with a girlfriend who you know, I was very much in love with, and a friend of mine said, I'll read this book. I don't know. <laughs> and I read it, and it, and it sort of really um, had a huge, I still want to use all these puns, like impact, but <laughs> it had a huge impact on it. See the breaking glass in the underpass. It wasn't like science fiction in the sense that it was outer space and stuff like that. It felt like it was five minutes into the future. And I loved that aspect of it, the fact that it was, it was kind of so outrageous, but so possible at the same time. Leatherette. A warm leatherette by the normal. The normal was the alias of Daniel Miller. Hear the, crushing steel. the lyrics are just a pricey of some of the concepts in in Crash Ballard's novel, which was about people who have car accidents and find that thereafter their sexuality has been diverted and they they are obsessed with being turned on by car crashes. So you know the lyric like the handbrake penetrates your thigh. Quick, let's make love before you die. <laughs> The music was supposed to be visual, you know, like driving along a, you know, a highway with big buildings either side and going into a tunnel. There's, a lot, there's quite a lot of humour in it, really. I mean, I, it wasn't meant to be like ap apocalyptic or dystopian. Miller was one of Britain's first synth punks, and he wasn't alone. In the north of England, a bunch of computer programmers dreamt of a similar future. Well, we, we love J.G. Ballard, and in, in fact, you know, Roxy had a song 2HB uh, about Humphrey Bogart, and we had a song for, for J.G., which was about J.G. Ballard. The future were a bunch of sci-fi nerds from Sheffield. They formed in 77 and played only synthesizers. When I bought my Korg 700S, in 1976. It was the first time there was a monophonic synthesizer which you could do stuff with, which was kind of domestic level, entry level, in terms of price. It was 350 quid, I think. And I remember distinctly thinking at the time, I was a computer operator, and there was a decision day where it was either buy a second-hand car and learn to drive, or go and buy this, this monophonic synthesizer. And uh, that proved to be quite a fateful day because I still can't drive, but um, I still got that synthesizer. This is a, a Mini Korg 700S and, and was sort of the first affordable synth. A fantastic machine, completely eccentric. Listen to the voice of Buddha. They give you a book, a book of patches with it, and because it was Japanese, that there would be, be things like, like Synthy Cat or Funny Frog, you know, and you can't follow why it's doing what it does, but it sounds great. Usually with a synthesizer, you can get it to do something for you that you, 
You know, you don't have to be manually good at all. That was why we turned to them in the first place, because no one could learn how to do the guitars either, because we'd all tried. My brother's a, a great guitarist, and he tried to teach me. It just hurts your hand. So we uh, use these things, and you, you know, you can press a switch on them, and they'll, they'll do things for about 10 minutes. It's quite interesting. If you've got a tape recorder, you can put it down, put something next to it, and it'll sound all right. The day that I joined the band, Martin came around to my house and he had two, two records under his arm. One was Trans Europe Express and one was I Feel Love. And he said, look, we can do this. I, th I think that was, that was his actual phrase. We loved all that stuff. I mean, like the concept albums that uh, George Romero did with uh, Donna Summer. One, two, three, four, five. We used to play those continuously. And this wasn't some kind of post-gay, ironic thing. It's just because they sounded great and interesting and you're never really sure what the next set of sounds coming up was going to be. I feel that it just didn't sound like any record that had been before. It's a, it came on the radio and, and you couldn't quite believe what you were hearing. It was hypnotic, but it was driving. Marauder's Moog music was the disco single of 77. Its success would set the template for the future of the future. We were in fact much more influenced by Marauder than we were by Kraftwerk. Everyone, ever since anyone that knows we use since, oh, you sound like Kraftwerk, don't you? It's, well, we use the same instruments, so some of the sounds are, are a bit the same. We never really wanted to be Kraftwerk. We wanted to be a pop band. We wanted to embody a sense of futurism without being so literal. And it just so happened, we, uh, a friend of ours, he had bought for him this um, science fiction board game called Star Force. And it was prodigiously tedious. I mean, it was real geek stuff. Uh, and it was impenetrable. You couldn't play it. There was the rise of the Human League or something. And we thought, the Human League, that is such a cool name. No future, they say. The Human League set out to make electronic pop for the modern city. The Human League had a totally different spin on synthesizers where it was much more like this bright technocratic optimism thing and in fact in one of their early songs blind youth you know they make fun of people who go on about dehumanization I'd say most of the brightness came from Martin. Martin's very optimistic, and if anyone's moaning about anything, Martin will go and write a song in the opposite direction. I think I felt a bit gloomy about the concrete jungle and everything, which is ridiculous, because I'm a townie. You know, I, I gravitate towards concrete, if, you know. <laughs> if you put me in the country, I would just find the nearest town and go and I'll be sitting in a bar quite quickly. Unfortunately, British pop music wasn't quite ready for a synth-led group of futurists, just yet. But in 1978, the Human League weren't the only group experimenting with electronics in Sheffield. This is the old um, Salterline Art College, which used to be part of the Sheffield Polytechnic in the 1970s. I believe the Human League also played this very place for their first ever uh, live show in Sheffield. Cabaret Voltaire did perform um, in this very room. Yeah, I mean, we just thought there was nothing, nothing for us, you know. I mean, it was all kind of bloated super groups and, and, and progressive bands who weren't even from the same kind of social backgrounds, you know, they, they were probably public school educated, whereas I think, you know, most of the scene in Sheffield was pretty solid, kind of working class. You, you'd find little bits of uh, 
interest in music within perhaps some of the prog rock stuff where there'd be a weird little synth bro 